and Sri. So Shrav Sundaram here. Uh, my presentation is on mastering the zoom lens, how to capture compelling bird photos without breaking the bank. Uh, Steve, can everyone see see my screen? Looking good? Well, I certainly can. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. Sounds good. So let me get started with my background. So I got interested in bird watching at six years of age, picked up my first camera in 2008, started taking pictures seriously with the DSLR in 2014. And some of my favorite subjects include raptors, hummingbirds, bobcats, and such. I started off mostly with birds, but I've expanded a lot. You know, I do mammals, reptiles, basically whatever I'm interested in. A little bit about my professional background. I have a BS in wildlife, fish, and conservation biology, and a minor in education. And I'm currently working in the environmental science and compliance field. So here's a brief outline of some of the items I'm going to address in today's presentation. I'm going to start out with some of the myths about zoom lenses, which include lower sharpness, slower autofocus. And I'm also going to address a lot of the pros, affordability, flexibility, compactness, having a closed minimum focus distance or working distance, as some photographers like to call it. And of course, with every piece of technology, there's going to be some cons. So I'm going to talk about you know, some of the cons as well, such as dark conditions, cluttered backgrounds, and variable aperture. Then I'm going to touch on some closing thoughts and address questions and answers. So myth one, sharpness. There's a notion that prime lenses are much sharper than zoom lenses. And I think this had a lot of truth back in the earlier days of digital, I'd say up until the 2010s. And then I noticed that I have, have used both lenses and I, I wasn't able to notice much of a field difference, especially when hand holding. So as I've stated here, it could be true of comparing a top of the line native prime lens to a third party or older zoom lens. And it could be true on lab tests on tripod, which I see a lot of. And those are good guides, you know, to let you know if a lens is sharp. But until you get into the field with two lenses, handhold both of them, figure out if, if and how you can handle the weight, um, you're not going to really get a good picture of the results. So until you handhold them, compare the test results in the field, um, it's difficult to, you know, draw conclusions from these lab tests in controlled environments on tripods. So I've noticed that handheld results tend to be a lot closer with some of these heavy, expensive prime lenses and the uh, more affordable medium zoom lenses. So I, I think I touched on this earlier. I think right around 2014, 15, I noticed modern zooms close the gap on sharpness. And I've noticed they tend to have better image stabilization in some cases. And this might just be a function of the lower weight of the lens, meaning it's you know more handholdable and manageable. I've listed some good examples of zooms here across companies. This isn't exhaustive by any means, and I'm not really going to talk about this too much unless someone has questions, which um, you know, feel free to type in the chat. But I've just listed a couple representatives from the big three camera manufacturers. So mid to slower autofocus. I think this is really interesting, and this has actually shifted a lot because I think back in the DSLR days, I want to say that autofocus was mostly lens driven. I know cameras did play a role, but I, I noticed the, the lens would have a bigger impact. But since I started shooting mirrorless, I noticed that the autofocus is almost more dictated by the camera than the lens. Not to say that both aren't important, but it's really become almost, I'd say, like a 50-50 or almost a 70-30. I, I would say the camera is the primary determinant of autofocus efficiency and speed. So modern zooms, especially on the high-performance mirrorless bodies, can have very fast autofocus. And I'd say it's it's pretty neck and neck to some of the prime lenses. Maybe, you know, you'll notice a slight, slight edge, but I don't think it's anything that you would easily pick up in the field. And I'd like to add that there's an added benefit that these lenses are smaller, lighter, and being zooms are easier to photograph mobile birds like birds in flight. And here's a couple examples. The one on the bottom left is a red-shouldered hawk. They're pretty quick. They don't really give you much of a signal when taking off. And 
I had pretty good success here tracking this bird. On the right, it's an osprey, you know, slower moving bird, but still, um, you know, sometimes they can dip a little bit and be a little tough to track with their coloration. Worked really well. So having used both the heavier prime lenses and the zooms, I, I didn't really notice much of a difference in autofocus performance. And I actually had a higher keeper rate with the zoom since I was able to pan and track much more easily. And now we're into the pros. So I'd like to start with the most obvious pro. And I always like to say that wildlife photography is never going to be cheap. I know there's photographers out there who say gear doesn't matter. That's just not true. I can't, I, it, it kind of irritates me actually when that's thrown around. I think what they mean to say is you really need to have a good understanding of gear for expensive equipment to matter. But um, uh, I will say that um, to get performance that allows you to get, you know, birds in flight, low light photographs and get those shots that really put you over the edge because let's face it, technology is at a point where it's very easy to get shots of stationary subjects. So really the true test is, low light conditions, uh, birds in flight, in the middle of this. That, that sort of, you know, no, you the, the subjects that really test and push the limits of technology. And I, I will say that this is a pretty stark difference in cost, even though, you know, um, I just referenced Canon here since I'm currently shooting Canon, even though this is no small sum, you can see the difference in cost between, you know, a mirrorless zoom lens and a mirrorless, you know, big prime lens. So. There's a massive difference in price and you can invest that money in trips, multiple bodies, memory cards, battery grips, extra batteries, tripods, et cetera. And I also wanna say that these are two different lenses and they do have different purposes and you do get what you pay for in certain situations, which I'll touch on at the end of my presentation. But I guess the question is, is it really worth it for what you do? Is this Delta and price really worth it? And you know, I can't tell you yes or no, my purpose of this presentation is to arm viewers with some facts and make an informed decision about what gear is best for them and what their purpose is. So I also wanted to add that there is the opportunity to buy older adaptive glass, like you could buy a DSLR prime lens, but then you have issues such as lower image stabilization, increased weight. Some of these 500 and 600 mm lenses are really heavy. And the autofocus, you know, it's pretty good adapted, but you know, it's not gonna be as fast as some of these native lenses. So that's an option if you really want the aperture gains, but there is a price to pay as well. So the second pro, and I think this is probably the biggest selling point of a zoom across all genres of photography, it's the ability to take multiple compositions from the same position by zooming in and out. I think this is really, really useful if you're A, in a place where you can't move, edge of a cliff, laying down at the water's edge. And if the subject comes closer than you anticipate, um, you know, you can reframe and you can also take multiple shots. Like you can see in this case, uh, this Costa's hummingbird, I was shooting from a similar position, got, you know, was able to get one close up on a stick and then one habitat shot on a yucca plant and you know they kind of flip between the perches pretty fast and uh, had I had a prime lens I may not have been able to get these very deferring compositions from a similar position. I also wanted to add that when you have the flexibility of taking multiple compositions from a single point um, you minimize your chances of disturbing the subject so if you're set up somewhere you have that flexibility of taking multiple shots without moving. And uh, hummingbirds are pretty tolerant, but you know, there's certain birds like raptors, passerines and stuff that, you know, if you move a little suddenly, or if you move at all, they can, you know, jump or move to a different perch. So that's another added benefit here. So now I'm gonna go through some shots. I've listed my settings below. So this was, a cedar waxwing gathering. This was taken with the R5, 100 to 500. Most, that's the lens I currently use. I was at 132 of a second, ISO 4000, F7.1 at 472 millimeters, and this was handheld. So what I liked here is uh, I was able to, so I was shooting at 500 and then I zoomed out, zoomed uh, 
out a little bit to just get a slightly f wider field of view. I don't know if it was necessary or not, but um, I really liked that I was, you know, able to be very mobile with the zoom here, get the framing I wanted in the shot, and this is barely cropped. And I think a shot like this would be difficult with a heavier lens because, you know, it was happening so quickly. This was a, a frosty day in Sacramento. I was just incidentally there driving through downtown Sac. I saw this huge murmuration of about 500 birds on these pyracantha bushes. And I at first assumed they were actually starlings, but then I got a closer look and these were wax wings. So uh, I, I told my mom, we need to pull over in here and I need to get out and get some shots. Cause if you know, wax wings are pretty skittish birds usually, but uh, I think the fermented berries got them a little intoxicated. So they were just going crazy, dropping down, going back up to these bushes. And it got to the point where berries were rolling on the street. They were grabbing them from the street. So it was just an amazing situation. And even though they were so tolerant, I think there was a great benefit in me being able to be stationary, zoom in and out and photograph this scene. So the third pro is compactness. And I think the key with compactness is shorter reaction times. Sometimes when I'm photographing birds in flight, like barn owls, golden eagles in flight, I, I have a milliseconds to react, right? And sometimes, you know, with a bigger, bulkier lens, I'm just not able to get the get the lens up, find the subject in the viewfinder as fast as I could. With the zooms, it's pretty quick. So that's that's always helpful. And easier and longer hand holding. I personally am a uh, I'm pretty much 80 to 90% or even more of a hand holding photographer. I just seem to enjoy that more. I'm able to get where I need to be, react in the times that allow me to capture behavior. My goal with photography is to always capture behavior. Uh, I'm trying to capture, you know, whether it's birds in flight, birds feeding, you know, nesting, whatever it is. I'm trying to capture something beyond just the standard portraits. I still do a lot of that, but you know, it's just how my photography has evolved over the years. So that's always helpful because um, if you have a very heavy lens in your hand holding, even if you can take the weight over time, you're gonna start shaking more. And the more you shake, the less likely you are to properly frame an image, uh, the more blurry frames you're gonna get. So those are things to keep in mind and you're gonna need to rest more frequently. Whereas with some of these lighter zooms, I can hold them up all day. I will also say there's more flexibility for creative angles due to the smaller size. I've been able to shoot under guardrails, you know, lie down, use the flip screen to hold the camera close to water. That would be very, these things would be very difficult to do with a very heavy lens since, you know, the front of the lens would tip and it would be hard for me to balance it. So that's, that's another benefit. I'd also like to point out that there is handheld video potential. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to embed that video there, but uh, a lot of the modern zooms on mirrorless have very, very good stabilization and you can almost get usable footage handheld straight at a camera or with a little bit of stability added in post. And actually for that wax wing scene, I was able to switch to video and capture some great video of them just you know going up and down in slow motion. So um, you know, for someone like me who enjoys capturing behavior, Mirrorless cameras offer great video potential, and I'm able to switch without looking from the viewfinder between stills and video and just uh, have a better experience in nature and come back with more content as well. I also wanted to add that travel is often a challenge with some of the larger lenses. With some of these little lenses, you can throw it in a carry-on bag very easily. I think you might be able to on some of the larger lenses too, but it's just a little more challenging and you need probably need larger bags and such. So here's a red shouldered hawk, uh, the same one that I had shared another image of. Um, so I've included some of my equipment here, again, with the 100 to 500 lens and they take off very quickly. So my reaction times were small and they don't really give too much of a signal. So I was basically just holding it up until I got tired, holding it up until I got tired. And I guess you could set it on a tripod, but they fly very fast. And this was in Santa Cruz in quite an urban place. So this hawk was very used to people. So I was quite close. So I don't think I would have been able to pan my tripod fast enough. 
So I'd say in this case, just being able to hold that lens literally one or two hours up, you know, waiting for the takeoff, getting the right poses, not fatiguing too much and not shaking too much was pretty instrumental in capturing these nice wings out poses. And even though red shouldered hawks are very common, they're very tough birds to photograph. I usually see them off freeway poles, you know, fast food drive throughs. I don't really see them in good situations for high level photography. So I was really able to capitalize on that and capture a look at them, look a look, you know, that they don't usually give you. And, you know, you can see all the patterns on the wings and such here. So just that ability to hold the lens up, react quickly, pan with the subject were instrumental in getting these images. Uh, uh, I'm sure many of you in this group heard of this occurrence. These eared grebes nested in considerable numbers in Pretendon Marsh this year uh, by shoreline. It's not typical behavior for them. I don't think it happens annually. I believe it last happened in 2017, which was another wet and cold year, or at least in these numbers. And yeah, I was very, you know, excited about this and I really wanted to get these low level images that I wouldn't think I would be possible, you know, in the, in the Bay Area. So what I did in this case was I held the camera down to the water's edge and used the flip out screen. And because of the light weight of the lens, I was able to balance it quite easily and capture these really low perspectives that, you know, gave me a nice background. And it just added that level of intimacy to the image because it looks like I was right there in the water with them. Almost. And it's possible to get these images with a heavier lens as well, but it's just a little more challenging. So you can see some of my settings here. The gear was the Canon R7 and 100 to 500. I was at 1 1,000th of a second. I saw 1,000, F7.1 at 500 millimeters handheld. And yeah, this was a, an osprey nest up north out in Solano County. And what was interesting about this land, this nest was in order to get this nice transition hill background, which I liked, you actually had to shoot under the guardrail on a bridge. So a lot of the bigger lenses wouldn't fit. Like, you know, you wouldn't be able to fit it and you'd get the, the top of that rail post in the image. So because I was able to almost sit down, put my feet on the guardrail and stick the lens under, I was able to get this interesting image that almost looks like I was eye level with this osprey nest that I was photographing off the bridge. And I like to say photography is all about angles. If I stood up and shot this image, you'd see all the ripples of the water. You, you know, not get this pleasing transition, which shows some of the lakeside habitat. So I really like to think that a little effort to get down, get eye level goes a long way. And I think in this case, having a lens that I was able to maneuver and stick under that guardrail really helped. So yeah, you can see some of my settings here. I was at a very fast shutter speed because I was trying to get, get the mom flying as well, which I did. And that's another nice thing about the lighter lens is if some kind of action happens, you're in a better position to react. So the third pro is a closed minimum focus distance. And I think a lot of zooms have a minimum focus distance under 10 feet, and I should define minimum focus distance. And the minimum focus distance is the closest you can focus at a given focal length. So for example, if I'm shooting a 100 to 500 ml Canon lens, uh, the closest minimum focus distance at 500 millimeters is I believe 2.9 feet. So that's a very tight minimum focus distance. And I find that very helpful because, um, you know, if wildlife gets closer or, um, you know, another subject presents itself, you're not, you know, in a conundrum or you don't have to switch lenses, get dust into your camera or miss the opportunity. And I think typically most of the larger fixed focal lenses have minimum focus distances around 10 to 13 feet. So it's a little bit longer. And I think some of them, um, and maybe some of them go down to eight feet, but you know, then you run into issues of framing as well, right? Because if you have a subject so close, even if you do focus, sometimes you know, may clip part of the subject. So I think just having that close minimum focus distance is helpful for certain subjects, and it gives you that flexibility to get shots that you would you couldn't miss otherwise. 
so yeah, here's a situation where I used the close minimum focus distance to what I think was good effect. Um, so there was this very tolerant male Anna's hummingbird. I think I was seeing him all year as I was hiking a park. And what I noticed was each time I saw him, he let me get closer and closer. It was right by the trail. So he was just in full breeding season mood, and, you know, probably hormones raging, didn't care about humans. And what was funny was I just had this idea. I had so many shots of him, like in the previous slide, this one, stretching and doing all that. What if I just got as close as I could with the crop sensor camera and just tried to get almost a macro type of shot, near macro shot of him? So I tried that and it was just a fascinating image to me. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we always try to get the whole bird in the frame. And I do agree that's generally more aesthetic and preferable, but sometimes once you've already gotten that shot, uh, I think it's good to think, what more can I get? Could I get something more of the habitat? Could I go even further in and just, you know, show the texture of the feathers? And I think with hummingbirds, that's a pretty cool perspective since they have these unique physical properties in their feathers. You know, the the, the actual phys physical structure of the feathers is what, you know, causes this iridescence. So I think um, by being able to access that close minimum focus distance on a crop sensor camera, I was able to get this tiny, you know, four inch bird so large in the sensor. And something like this, I think would look great printed large. Yeah, here's another example. Uh, this was at the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. I'm pretty sure a lot of group members are very familiar with that spot. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenal place for Allen's hummingbirds. I just love watching them going there year after year. And again, you know, this, this male just landed right by me, probably about, you know, five to seven feet, maybe even less. And I figured, you know, uh, if I had a bigger lens I, that was fixed focal length, I may not have been able to get this exact framing or even focus this close. And I believe this is a plant that's native to Australia and the Australian garden. And I think this, it almost looks like a horizontal palm tree here and just the the whole framing and foliage of the image was interesting. And I think this hummingbird was a little bit farther on a higher bush and then he came into this alternate perch. So I was able to adjust and capture this more unique environmental image because of the close focal length, focal minimum focus distance and, you know, just being able to react so quickly. Uh, here's another example where I found the close minimum focus distance very, very helpful. Um, I think, uh, I shared a couple of Costa's hummingbird photographs earlier. Those were taken at Joshua Tree National Park Visitor Center. And as I was photographing this hummingbird, I heard a gurgling behind me and this roadrunner was building a nest and calling for a mate. And he just hopped up on this beautiful rock right at sunrise in the desert, probably like 5.30 AM. And, you know, just, just being, you know, from going from shooting one subject up close and just turning around and having another subject right up to me, um, if I didn't have a, you know, a lens that could focus at this close range that I could react so quickly with, I would have missed this opportunity. And I, I think this is one of my favorite images I've gotten of Roadrunners over the years. A nice rock, nice morning glow and good details on the subject. So I think, you know, especially when you're in a environment with a lot of subjects and you, you're not really sure what you're going to photograph, my personal style, you know, it's a lot of walk around, get what I get. I don't do a whole lot of, I do a little bit of it, but I don't do a whole lot of sit on tripod and wait photography. I think a zoom lens has a lot of value since it allows you to, you know, maximize your chances of photographing multiple species in multiple situations. So as with any piece of technology, there's always going to be some cons. And one of these cons I've noticed is there's certain birds that inhabited dense forest, dark areas, and they're more crepuscular, so dawn, dusk, active, and nocturnal. And most of the zooms I'm referring to that are more affordable and portable are around f5.6 to f7.1 in aperture. So they're, the pupil of the lens is narrower. It doesn't let in as much light as, say, an f4 or an f2.8 lens, which you know usually tends to be fixed focal length. So with that, you know, you have to be prepared to shoot at higher ISOs. 
And I think, you know, with modern post-processing software and such, and autofocus systems on the mirrorless cameras, this is becoming a lot better, but, you know, it's still always going to be beneficial to have a lens that lets in more light in these situations, and you, you can't get around that. And sometimes when you can't get a subject with a distant background, clutter can be an issue in the background. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more on another slide. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then some zooms are variable aperture. So what that means is at the lowest focal length, say 100 millimeters, it would be something like f4.5. And at the longest focal length, it would be f7.1. And the reason is, um, to ensure the lens is compact, because if it had a continuous aperture, it would be very heavy and very expensive, kind of like the bigger prime lenses. So that's not a big issue. I would just be, at least for me, I would just be aware that, you know, the aperture is what you want it to be. So just when you're shooting, if you want it, say you're at 500, something comes closer and you want to keep that aperture, you know, you might have to scroll it down. Or if you want to let in, for me, I typically want to let in as much light at a given focal length. So I want the aperture to float. So I just make sure it's doing that. And I shoot manual mode with auto ISO. So the camera, you know, compensates for that. So here's another, I call this a low light image, as in it, it's not an image that I was particularly happy with. And it was also taken in low light. So I was very excited to see this varied thrush. It's not a subject I've seen off, often. I was hiking the John Nicholas Trail in Sanborn Park. Beautiful trail, but you know, if you've been on this trail, you know this trail is 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 the bane for, you know, ISO. You're you're through the roof with ISO pretty much the moment you set foot on the trail. And you can see my shutter speed was one one hundredth of a second, which was kind of as low as I really wanted to go here, and my ISO was sixty four hundred and. Um, you know, this image didn't quite have the image quality I wanted, and um, part of the reason this image wasn't great was the subject was a little too far as well. But um, I guess the benefits of having a wider aperture lens here is you could have shot at, say, one four hundredth of a second and, and maybe at the same ISO, and you would have gotten more keepers. I think out of 20 shots, I had maybe two or three that were sharp. And... Um, or you could even, you know, if you're using a tripod or you're hand holding using your knee, you could shoot at this shutter speed and keep your ISO lower for better image quality potentially. So this is a situation where um, maybe if the subject was closer, I still would have gotten a great image, but this was a potential drawback case in low light when the subject is far, you have to crop a lot. Um, these more portable zooms because they're entry pupil of the lens, aka aperture is smaller, don't, you know, allow you enough light to work with. Now, this is an image I took a, a long exposure. And this is a Western screech owl. And I'll talk about a couple issues here with this image. And the first issue was the background. Now, I think a lot of people are have a misconception that if you have an f2.8 lens or an f4 lens, you're automatically going to get a nice buttery background. And that's not true. I don't think that's true at all. You still need to really be mindful of how you're placing yourself and moving. But what I will say is if you are photographing at f2.8 or f4 and you have a background like this, it, it will be more noticeably blurred. And you can do things in post. And sometimes I'll do a little bit in post, but I personally don't like over-processing my images. So I always try to move around. I almost pay more attention to the background than the bird itself sometimes. And I think that's you know, an important attribute to try, try to get the, get the look you want in an image. But uh, I will say a, a wider aperture fixed focal length or you know, wider aperture zoom would have probably yielded a more pleasant, less distracting background in this case. Also, because I was shooting, I think because screech owls are so small, I was shooting with the, this was an older image when I was still shooting the adapted 100-400 lens. I was using the extender, so I was at f8, and maybe that wasn't the best choice, but then I might have had, had to crop too much if I wasn't using the extender. So you can see my ISO for a one-second exposure was already 6,400. And, you know, screech owls stay pretty still, so you can get a couple shots at one second. I've even gotten shots up to four, five, even eight seconds. but if you have a lens that lets in more light, you can probably keep this ISO 6400 and 
half, you know, you shoot at a half a second or a quarter of a second and you'll get a lot more keepers. So I guess, you know, in a situation where you're kind of in a fixed point photographing an owl in a hole or on a branch, that's where maybe, you know, the on a tripod, that's where these zoom lenses, you know, that's where you probably see that gap. And that's when I think the decision of, hey, do I do this type of photography where I'm sitting, you know, in low light, photographing a bird at a fixed distance and, you know, fixed perch often enough that it warrants me purchasing, you know, a $12,000 lens. So I think that's where, um, you know, these decisions have to be made. And I also wanted to touch on a bonus category of other wildlife. So I do a lot of mammal and reptile phot photography recently. Uh, I actually love photographing mammals and reptiles as much as birds, so it's pretty much 50-50 for me. And, you know, sometimes I'm hiking on the trails looking for birds and such, and I'll see a bobcat or see a, you know, a lizard that I want to photograph. And this is a pretty close shot because I was at 343 millimeters, and this is not really cropped. So this cat just walked right by me, maybe three to five feet, and I wouldn't have been able to photograph her had I had a fixed focal length lens because I wouldn't have been able to focus and I wouldn't have been able to fit her full body in the frame had I even been able to focus. So again, I think if you're in a in an environment where you're not only photographing multiple birds, but also, you know, other subjects and you don't want to have the hassle of carrying too much gear and you want to be reactive and quick, I think having a zoom lens can be very effective and helpful. Yeah, and here's a couple other instances. Uh, this is an endangered blunt-nosed leopard lizard. And I was able to get this nice portrait of one of them. Really pretty lizard kind of found in Central Central Valley area. And um, you can't really get these type of photographs with a larger, you know, prime lens because you're not gonna be able to focus so close. And this is a weasel kit um, taken in the North Bay. This one just popped up right up to me, was very curious. and I was probably about, I was laying down and I was probably about four or five feet away and I wouldn't have been able to acquire focus here had I been shooting a larger lens. So just, you know, another two examples, kind of like the Bobcat that illustrate the versatility of a zoom lens. And, you know, I'll touch on this in the next slide, but personally, I believe if, even if someone, you know, has a prime lens and shoots that, I think there's value in having a zoom lens as a secondary lens as well. So. I think it's 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 just very valuable to have in everyone's kit for you know affordability and versatility reasons. So for some closing thoughts, whether a zoom will fit your needs will depend on your budget. And I also wanted to add that recently I've been seeing more compact prime lenses coming out. It's just been happening with Nikon, I believe. They've released a couple lenses like an 800 6.3 lens that's very light, a 400 f 4.5 lens that's very light. I believe they have had a 500 f 5.6 lens for a while. So uh, if you don't really need the zoom and you're primarily a bird photographer and you're shooting at fixed distances, but you don't want to spend $12,000 on a lens and you're looking for something more in the two to $5,000 range, um, Nikon currently has some good offerings if you can get hands on them and hopefully the other companies follow suit. So that's another option. But then again, you know, you lose some of that flexibility, like the close focus, minimum focus, this, the ability to zoom. So um, it gives you the flexibility of cost and weight and you're able to handhold it, but you're still not able to, you know, get images like these with a smaller fixed focal length lens since you don't have that close minimum focus distance, nor do you have that ability to zoom in and out. And then length weight, I think this is a very important consideration. Irrespective of cost, you know, these, these lenses, um, you need to be able to handle them and they've come down in weight a lot. I believe most of these new 600 F4, 400, 2.8 mirrorless lenses are around six to six and a half pounds. But when you carry that, for multiple miles hiking, or you're holding it up for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, um, there is a lot of fatigue. And even if you're able to get it back up, there's going to be a lot of shakes. So um, I think that's something to consider, you know, whether you like hand holding a lot, whether you like using a tripod, 
and whether you can handle this lens from a weight perspective and even bulk perspective, right? Because it's not just the weight of the lens. You have to be able to you know, maneuver it and position your hands properly on it and hold it steady. And I think I touched on it on a previous slide, the style of photography, whether you're on a tripod or you're walking around or whether you do a bit of both. I think that's very important. I've always been someone who enjoys walk around photography. So that's always what I've gravitated towards. And I think that's why I tend to love using these zoom lenses so much. I really enjoy it. I do do a little bit of tripod photography, but I don't think at this point enough to warrant me purchasing a prime lens. So that's another thing to consider. What do you like? And then another uh, point is the habitat one typically photographs in. And I think I touched on that. Um, the John Nicholas Trail, for example, where I was photographing very thrush, that's a habitat where I really do see value for a prime lens, just because you want to let in as much light as possible. If you're going to a place like Ecuador, for example, rainforest, you want a prime lens probably because even at those wide apertures, you, you oftentimes have to use a high ISO. But if you're in, you know, California, you're shooting a little bit more oak woodland, open habitats, wetland, then it becomes, is do you really need that wide aperture, especially with modern cameras being so good at higher ISOs, post-processing software being so capable? So that's another question that one needs to ask themselves. And I think the sec the last item is a variety of species one photographs. You know, is someone just photographing smaller birds at a farther distance? Then, you know, a zoom may not be beneficial. But if you're photographing, you know, some larger birds, birds in flight, mammals, you know, stuff, subjects outside of birds. I think that's where a zoom really shines because you have one lens that can do it all. You're not going to miss shots and you're going to be able to, you know, cover all the subjects you desire. I think all in all, uh, I hope you found this presentation helpful and informative in some of your camera purchase or usage decision making. I think uh, what I would say as closing thoughts is, uh, I believe a zoom lens has a place in everyone's kit. So even if you have a prime lens and you use that most of the, most of the time, say you need to go on a hike where you can't bring that lens or you're trying to photograph something else that may come a little closer. I think there's value to having that lens in your kit. And I also wanted to point out that, um, you know, those prime lenses are unattainable for many people, you know, due to finances or, you know, you've got to insure the lens or the weight of the lens, it, 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 it's it's more than just the you know monetary cost that makes those lenses a little challenging. So I wanted to point out that you can still get elite images with some of these modern zoom lenses. You don't necessarily need to shell out 10K. Now, uh, it, you still need to shell out probably something like two to three, three to four grand to get you know the performance that you know comes close to these 10 to 12K lenses. But I think it's great because photography is becoming more accessible to all of us. And thanks for listening, everyone. And I think I'll open it up for the Q&A session. Thank you, Shrav. That was excellent. <clears throat> yeah, so if any of you have questions, um, either put it in chat or just jump right in, unmute yourself and jump right in. Yeah, I think I see Leah had that first question about uh, what... I guess it's for the group, so maybe others can chime in as well, but I will let you know my thoughts on Topaz AI software. Now, yeah. I think Topaz AI is a very powerful tool. However, I would like to say that I think a lot of people misuse it. I think what people tend to do is they tend to put an image straight at a camera, run it through it at default settings. And I think what I've noticed Topaz does is it's a very strong AI reduction software. It applies very strong settings on default. So I noticed this very cartoonish effect you tend to get a lot of smudging and blurring. So how, how I personally use Topaz is, I use a software that I find works better for me. It's called DxO Pure Raw. Uh, oh, yeah. it, it renders the raw files um, you know, more naturally and removes the noise. And most of the time I don't need to use Topaz, but say I'm shooting at higher ISOs, 6,400 to 12,800, I will run the file again through Topaz and I will run it at minimum settings, disable sharpening and such, just so I don't get that cartoonish effect. So I'd say Topaz has a place in my workflow, but it's not, I don't find it works for me as a primary noise reduction software. And my recommendation to others is to use something like DxO or uh, Lightroom has a new nice AI to noise feature. Use that as a primary noise reduction. And if you need to pass it through Topaz after, then maybe use it that way. 
Right. I mean, I actually use um, DxO also. I use a DxO Photo Lab, and mm -hmm. um, instead of Photoshop, mm -hmm. and it does a really, really good job, especially with noise reduction and things like that. Um, but I have noticed that I have, I mean, and I have the the new Z8 with a 400 millimeter lens that I've been trying to get out there and use a little bit more often. But uh, some some uh, foot problems and knee problems are causing me to not do that so much. Um, but uh, trying to just, I do have a little bit of shake because of of uh, just trying to get used to this new camera. And I'm trying not to use Topaz AI because too much because it's just like you write the really really bad cartoonish type of uh, atmosphere afterward and I mean it, it really does almost look like it like plastic you know yeah. it, sometime you know and and I just don't like that plastic look so you know I might do whatever I'm doing in DxO first and I'm going well let me just export it into Topaz AI and let's see what it'll do and then I'll be like ugh, no I'm not doing that <laughs> you know yeah. I was like I'll, ex I'll accept the uh the little, the, maybe it's not quite as crisp sharp because I really like crisp sharp um, bird bird feathers. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I love that in my pictures. Yeah. Uh, whenever I do the, my processing, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but there are some times with with topaz, it's just like wow, it's wonderful for faces. I don't know if anybody's ever uh, you know taken pictures of people, and it's been like a little um, uh, a little noisy, and their face recognition is amazing i was absolutely blown away at how great how good it was because i was taking some pictures with my son when he was in a jujitsu class and just the pictures of the face you know even after dxo processing was still mm, a little bit grainy and running it through the topaz ai it was just like crystal clear perfect and i was like that okay that's amazing so maybe it has its place in in different different aspects you know, I guess I guess just like every every Photoshop program or you know every uh, post processing program has its own specialties. I think that's a good point and great question, Leah. I will say like my golden rule for post processing, and this is because like you like you, I like capturing natural looking detailed images. My golden rule is never do too much. Right. And what I like doing is even if I start with something as a default, I will turn stuff way down, turn it way up. I, I will see where it goes and. I don't usually like post-processing software making all the decisions for me. And what I will say is with any software, be it Topaz, DxO, Lightroom, Photoshop, even if you run something through one of these powerful AI tools, take a look at what you're seeing and if you like it or not and make adjustments as needed. I think um, uh, with a lot of modern software, it seems so powerful. People just assume you can just put it in and get it out and just move on, but I, I think that it pays great dividends to stop, take a look, tweak a little bit, and it doesn't take too long, just a couple minutes, and I right. think it can really go a long way to results. Right, right, yeah. No, I was just interested to see if anybody else has used it as well in their, um, in, you know, is it one of your tools in your toolbox? Hmm. Okay, so I see the next question on the chat, and, you know, um, feel free to type it in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom or you know, shout it out. Linda's question, have I ever tried using a monopod? How often do I use the extender? Both great questions. So I don't usually use a monopod just because I, I just like being able to move a lot. And because I shoot stuff like mammals, like if I'm photographing birds and a bobcat shows up, that monopod just gets in my way and my ability to drop is, you know, to the ground is is is, is reduced. And what I would like to add is on modern mirrorless cameras, the lens stabilization and the body stabilization is so good, especially with these lighter lenses. I'm able to handhold down to one by 50th of a second quite effectively. I get like 40 to 50% keepers. So I haven't really found a, a, a use for a monopod. Um, although I can see situations like that red shouldered hawk where it might've you know saved my arms a little bit, but just not enough use cases for me to make that purchase personally. And regarding the extender, I don't use an extender anymore. I used to use an extender because I was using a 100 to 400, then I upgraded to a 100 to 500. And um, what I do is instead of an extender, I use a crop sensor body when I'm photographing smaller subjects or farther ones. So 
I haven't really used an extender in the while. And I think the reason for that is not because the quality was bad. I've had great results using the extenders with the mirrorless. The reason is I was having issues extender swapping. Like sometimes I would put the extender on, light would get low, I'd swap it out, swap it in and out. And it just, it, it just kind of got a little frustrating because sometimes, you know, I'd be shooting a bird, then it would get dark. I'd be shooting a mammal then I'd have to take the extender off and, you know, potentially miss some photos. So that's my reason for not using an extender. I basically just like having my camera set up and just being able to shoot without thinking about swapping or changing too much on my gear. That way I minimize my chances of missing photos. And I see Mark has a question as well. What's the trade-off regarding extenders versus cropping, especially with the higher aperture with the extender? So that's a very good question. I guess there are two. So when you crop digitally, you know, you're obviously not increasing your photo, fo focal length. You're just increasing the perceived focal length or the perceived image size. So you're losing resolution. But in theory, if you're using a perfect extender, right, um, you're, get, you're ex increasing your actual optical focal length. And what I've found is on the mirrorless bodies, the image and quality and autofocus trade-off is, is much lower than, you know, back in the DSLR days. So I wouldn't be afraid of using high quality native extenders. Like, you know, by native, I mean, if you're shooting Canon, using a Canon extender, shooting Nikon, Nikon extender on a, you know, a good native lens, whether it's a modern zoom or a prime, I think, I think you can get good results, but I would say the, the loss of light is kind of the big concern. So when you lose that light, you know, be prepared to use a higher ISO. But I would say, say I was photographing a, a subject that was still, and I had enough light, or I could, you know, stabilize myself or reduce my shutter speed, I would usually pick the extender, just because I like, you know, printing large, I like my images being high resolution. Excuse me, that's just how, 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 how I am. But I, th I know some people just don't like using the extender because I think there are slight hits to autofocus performance, not for static subjects, but I've noticed when I'm photographing stuff like, you know, eagles in flight, falcons in flight, I typically don't really want the extender because I've noticed a slight drop in AF performance. But yeah, I would say the main trade-off is, you know, is you're losing a little bit of autofocus performance and you're losing that light. I mean, that was kind of what I wanted to ask was that with the uh, better light, you actually can lower your ice and get better quality. And for most photography, do you really need a 40, meg 40 megapixel image to really get a bird? Or is a 10 yeah. or 12 or 20 megapixel bird just fine? I mean, that's yeah. that's what I'm sort of seeing with this yeah. high resolution cameras. And I think that's a, that's a good point, Mark. But what I would like to add is I'll go back to some of these images. Like, you'd be surprised how small some of these subjects are. Like, um, uh, let me pull one of them. Like these guys, right? Um, and I wasn't using an extender because I was shooting at 500 millimeters, but things like hummingbirds, even when you get right up to them, uh, you'd be amazed at how small they are in the frame because you know they're literally the size of our thumb. So I think in situations like that, that's where I see value of extenders or you know using a longer focal length um, i think um, even though for example these cameras are 45 30 megapixels once you crop it to your final composition it's amazing how how quickly the resolution drops so mm -hmm. i also would like to add that when when at higher isos i've noticed that cropping is what really kills the image quality so what i've found is i almost prefer shooting at a higher iso and cropping less sometimes than shooting at a lower ISO and cropping more. Now that's that's kind of like a seesaw effect, but I, I will say that as we're getting better, you know, ISO performance, um, you know, better post-processing software, I, I think um, ISOs, you know, 3,200 to 6,400, not a problem at all. And 6,400 to 12,800 become opened up too. So I think ultimately it's a personal decision. And I think there's no right answer for either situation, but I will say that in 2023, my decision is more to use the extender at a higher ISO than to not use the extender and um, 
crop more, which is what I would have probably said maybe five, 10 years ago. But you know, if it's action or a moving subject, my 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 viewpoint changes and I, I say go bare lens all the way. Thank you. So the light, right? I think I, I have a Sony 200, 600, mm -hmm. an F1.4, it becomes an F9, mm -hmm. right? I think, it, and, and so then, you know, would I shoot at an F9 for a hummingbird, which is at a distance, or if the light was good, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, and 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 Sri, that's a good question. What I will say is, this sounds counterintuitive, but I, I will say if a subject is too far for your naked lens, if you put an extender on it, it's not often going to make that a great image. Oh. I almost use an extender when I'm almost at a distance where I could get a great image. Yeah. And it just gets me over the hump, yep. right? I think a lot of people think extenders are just like this magic switch you put on and a subject that's too far suddenly becomes a good image. I don't think that's what no. works. I think an extender, I think of it more as like, you just need a little more to get 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 that shot that you're looking for. So Fully hopefully that, that addresses your question, Shri. Like for example, you yeah. know that those hummingbird shots, um, if the hummingbird was too far, putting the extender on wouldn't make those shots good. It's almost like I was at a range where I was getting full body shots and then I wanted a head portrait or if it's a little bit too far and I wanted to just get myself a little closer. So the extender is a tool to turn a good image great, not a poor image good, in my opinion. Uh, very good point. Yeah, and fortunately on the Sony system, uh, I have the crop sensor built in. So I could do that and then still I'm shooting at f6.3 rather than f9. And that's a good tool. And you'll see for some of my shots, I, I use the same lens. I don't have the extender and that's for different reasons. Canon, Canon has some, you know, extender issues with their, with the 100 to 500. It doesn't zoom all the way with the extender. So what I do is if I know before the shoot, the subject is very small or far, I will use the crop sensor. And I, I use the full frame when I know I'm closer to the subject or if I'm trying to get action or a wider field of view. You're carrying both. Uh, I don't usually carry both. I sometimes do if if I'm doing multiple, but sometimes what I'll do is I will just, before I go, I will say, what am I going to photograph? Water birds, they're probably not going to be close enough. So I'll use the crop yeah. sensor. But yeah. if I'm doing mammals or if I'm doing, you know, a big bird, like a golden eagle, they're going to come, you know, fill the frame. So I'll use the full frame in those cases. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great talk, Shrav. Any yeah, it's a great things? discussion also. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. Thank you, Mark, um, Linda, and Leah. I think those were very thoughtful questions. And I hope, you know, listeners can take something away. And these are just uh I, I always like to say if you try to apply steady rules to photography, uh it, it's it's not gonna work. You you can apply generalities, you can even apply some, you know, majority use cases, but it's hard to really know until you've actually, sometimes I have to go out to a situation, like I've taken golden eagle photos with the extender and come back, oh, these are not in focus. So I, I was probably better off cropping more. So then the next time I you know, didn't use the extender, got better results. So you can't always make these decisions, even with a lot of experience before the fact, sometimes you just have to try and fail to learn. So oh, I have a different question. Um, and I, I know we talk about 100 to 500, usually 100 to 400 usually, right? Mm -hmm. Have you attempted uh, anything with the other zoom lenses, the 2470, for example, especially birds and environment, because that's a, that's an avenue I'm looking for getting more experience, show more of the environment. Thoughts on that? So yeah, I will say I haven't really dabbled in that. So you know, take everything I say here with a grain of salt. I will say that 24 to 70 on a full frame is such a wide, it's a landscape fo or portrait focal length, right? Yeah. So unless you're say at a, you know, the, like you're shooting puffins or gannets or albatross and, you know, a mm. controlled setting very close, I think it's almost like the subject is going to be so small in the frame. It's going to be hard to tell what's going on unless it's a massive bird, like an ostrich or an emu cassowary or you know something mm -hmm. of that nature maybe an egret heron you could work it out if you're close enough so i would say almost 
dabble with your 100 to 200 millimeter range on your 200 to 6 or if you have a 200 to 600 tree dabble at that 200 to 300 range let's see how that's getting you your perspective first before looking to a 2470 would be my advice okay yeah cool yeah yeah saves you some money too <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I mean, i'm just curious because you know it's yeah. it, when we want to show environment most mm -hmm. of us are so dedicated in getting the bird up close and personal and we want to show all the details. Yeah. Then I miss out on the environment and I come back home thinking, mm, could yeah. I have done something different? Yeah. And if you notice, sometimes, you know, the environment is, is it's not even as much of the focal length as moving a little bit around too. I mean, yeah. I mean, the focal length plays in the part, plays a part too. But if you remember that wax wing shot I shared earlier, right. that yeah. was taken at 470 millimeters, but it's still... You know, I was able to encompass a wide scene. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Multiple things at work. Yeah. And one quick comment, if you don't mind, for Leah. Um, I think I'm of the AI software. Definitely prefer denoise rather than sharpen. Yeah. Uh, well, I have I have pretty much all of them, you know, mm -hmm. and and then you know, then I think Topaz Photo AI does mm -hmm. a piece of all of them you know it's like you can do you can do sharpen you can do uh noise and you, you could do all different things and then you can also weight them differently as well um but but no i do i do like uh denoise <clears throat> if, if it's that's all i'm looking for you know yeah but yeah, yeah. Thanks. So I tried them all. I have Gigapixel too, which I don't think I've ever used. I think I bought a package type of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, but but the Topaz Photo AI has pretty much all of it. I mean, I have a friend, for instance, had a um, a picture of her one kitten that she wanted. That she just loved and loved this boy. She only had a screen capture from a photo from a Facebook, or she had a Facebook post, and she was like. I need to be able to, I want to be able to print this, but it's, you know, it's tiny, you know? So I, I ran it through uh, Topaz uh, uh, Photo AI and it, you know, increased it. It made it some weird things go on with the eyes, yeah. but everything else was, was perfect. It was quite amazing. Um, but I was like, you know, I don't know what to do about the eyes. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. yeah, it really did. It, it like just, it like increased the size of the picture four by four four times and it, it was you know at least it was almost a perfect image that she could print and put like on a frame and it, you know a small frame like a four by six or something like that nothing big huh interesting yeah, yeah. very cool okay any more questions okay well thank you shrav for a great presentation it's very informative you cover the topic extremely well and uh, yeah, see you all uh, a month from now. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for filling in, and thanks, Shri, yeah, for thank you, you know, yeah. making it as well. Hope everyone found this informative, and hope you have something to take away for your next shoot. Thank you, Shrav. Thank you, Shrav. Amazing pictures as always. So, yeah. love that Roadrunner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bobcat. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. I have yet to see one. So, yeah, maybe someday. Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Take Good care. Night. Bye. Thank you, Steve.